On the 24th of February 2022, Russia launched a military invasion of its neighbor country Ukraine, leading to an escalation of the conflict that began in 2014, when Russia commissioned the invasion of the Ukrainian peninsula, arguing authority and a desire for the independence of the ethnic Russians living there. This second invasion, in less than a decade, precipitated the European continent once again to the terrors of war. A nightmare still beating in the hearts of many, who vividly remember the conflicts of the 90s and the Second World War. Putin's paranoia and his insecurities about Russia's diminishing role in the global stage threw both his own citizens and the Ukrainian people into a brutal conflict that many believe to be a matter of national survival for Ukraine. The invasion has also led to the largest European refugee crisis since the Second World War, when another deluded dictator decided that his corner of the world was just not big enough. Over four months in, the devastation that Putin's war has brought to the country cannot be fully quantified. Yet the direct attacks against civilians mass executions, and countless other war crimes have deeply scarred the nation. And yet the invasion is considered broadly an absolute blunder. It turns out that Putin, a wannabe Stalin, is actually closer to a Tsar Nicholas, absolutely incapable of directing a successful campaign. The international response to Putin's actions has been swift and without mercy, as it should be. Tremendous sanctions have been imposed against it. It has been kicked out of the SWIFT banking system, thousands of foreign firms have pulled out of their country, and multiple contracts that bought oil from Russia are getting cancelled left and right. But the biggest impact can be seen in the wake-up call that Putin's war has meant for the rest of the European countries, whose military sectors have spent over 60 years underfunded and diminished. Even Germany, perpetually terrified of the darkness of its past, has tentatively reached for the trigger, with a complete overhauling of its military. Additionally, Finland and Sweden have officially asked to join NATO, the West's military alliance built to protect Europe against communism in the 20th century. Putin has made a blunder history students will make jokes about for decades, and he will be held along the lines of characters like Premier Neville Chamberlain, who, after meeting with Hitler in 1938, promised the UK citizens that there would be no war. Welcome to Rebel Economics, where we discuss about economics, business, and investing. If you enjoy your content, please consider subscribing. It really helps. There is no one like economists to take a look at the brutality of the war and think, yeah, yeah, death and destruction, but... What about the money? And for the most part of the 20th century, they have done just that. The traditional understanding of war within an economic framework is as a small hiccup that will eventually lead to further growth. The classical model tells us that wars, in their absolute brutality, open up avenues for tremendous direct investment of third parties in the ravaged country. From a traditional economic perspective, the demise of a nation and obliteration of its heritage and infrastructure, like buildings, sewages, telecommunications and electricity grids, essentially resets the country to a pre-exploited market. Meaning that there is much less necessary direct investment to be profited in from a country that has already all those systems required for modern life than it does trying to rebuild a destroyed nation. Note that this is an absolutely necessary action to be done. Without substantial direct investment, countries ravaged by war would be decades behind their neighbors in economic development, technological adoption, and employment. The size of the direct investment that countries destroyed by armed conflicts need will of course vary depending on the size of the conflict. Historically, the loser of the war has been the party burdened with the payment of reparations to the affected countries. Probably the most famous example of this is the Versailles Treaty, which demanded all of the blame and responsibility for the Great War to be laid at the feet of Germany, and therefore demanded repayment for the destruction brought upon the Allied nations. This never works out. 
Common Sense and Clouded by Revenge should tell us that war is never free for either country, independently of who started the conflict. But putting the mighty burden of reconstruction on the shoulders of a country that has just lost a war is bound to turn out terribly. Germany, of course, could not satisfy the payments to France after World War I. The rebuilding process slowed to a halt, and then we got the sequel that no one wanted. That is why third-party direct investment is crucial. Only countries whose economies have not been decimated, like the US after World War II, can actually play the role of reconstructor and moneylender, as was the case with the much more successful Marshall Plan after Germany's second defeat. The Marshall Plan, led primarily by the US, also gave financial aid to Germany, totaling $1.3 million, which would be about 17 billion modern dollars, and enabled the country to rise from the ashes of defeat. Even a single year before the end of the Marshall Plan in 1951, Germany had already surpassed her pre-war industrial production level. So the opportunity generated by war is undeniable. And the reasons many economies salivate at the sound of explosions is finally understood. But what about what is lost? What about the economic impact of everything that war essentially annihilates? Is war just a business from the outside looking in? In economics, there is a concept called the broken window fallacy, which works as a parable of how economists think about economic output while many times ignoring the impact of what is lost. Traditional economics might therefore tell us that a broken window is a blessing for the economy, the opportunity of direct investment to flow in and enhance the glass, wood, and plastic sectors. But it ignores everything else associated with a broken window. Let's take a look at everything that is lost. The broken window fallacy aligns the impact of unexpected losses and the private expenditures from an act that essentially serves to generate economic output, like a war. So the expenditures that might derive from it could be something like the extra energy it would take to heat up the house with a broken window at night, the possibility that someone tries to enter the house through the broken window and steal something during the night, or in case the individual cannot directly pay for the window repair, the interest on the loan that he or she will incur by borrowing the required money to be able to afford it. That is just a minuscule example, of course. Some of the fundamental economic costs of war that must be weighted against the increased economic activity that results from direct investment after an armed conflict might include something like this. The loss of standard economic activity during the time the destroyed country remains inoperable. Imagine, for example, how banks, the stock market, and other financial institutions will not be able to run successfully for some time after the war ends. All the aggregated losses those entities are responsible for must also be considered. For example, the bank will not be able to issue credit to people in the economy. The people will not be able to repay their loan interest. The collapse of the stock market, product of a war, in the mainland will evaporate billions of dollars in capital valuation, not to mention the fundamental losses that each day the stock market remains closed will have for a government taxing revenue generated from the sale of financial assets. Additionally, during a war, industries that would otherwise produce goods to be consumed in a capitalist society are now producing weapons and gear, where the main purchaser is the state. This transition towards the production of consumption goods and services once again will take time, and in the meantime, these factories might be caught with millions of dollars worth of wartime products that essentially no longer needs since the conflict is over. It does not matter whether the state ends up purchasing it, or if it rots in a warehouse. The loss is fundamentally incurred by the economy. Thirdly, it does not matter that direct investment creates new industries and employs workers from the decimated country. Those workers would have been soldiers just months if not weeks ago. The scars of war are tremendous, both physically, leaving a percentage of the population disabled or otherwise unfit for work, as well as psychological, with PTSD, anxiety, and depression running rampant in the population. It is not humane to expect those people who have recently transitioned from wartime soldiers back to peacetime workers to retain the same level of productivity as they would have the war not started. 
And finally, in the international markets, the impacts of war are even more dramatic. And they are compounded because they expand to other countries whose economies are also damaged. Take, for example, debts to be paid to international creditors by the destroyed country. Well, for the central bank, it certainly is not a priority to focus on repaying those. So there is a big chance the country might default on some of their debts, even if only temporarily. The impact of this can hardly be overstated. In a period where its very existence depends on international capital flowing its way. Furthermore, considering the maddenly complex nature of modern supply chains, it would be rare that a war in a country does not affect some other aspects of an industry. Take for example Ukraine, who is one of the largest wheat producers in the world, a resource that the global market counts on to avoid a global wave of famine. The international catastrophe that Ukraine's current inability to satisfy the foreign markets with food will have is impossible to predict, but it simply must be contemplated when assessing the economic impact of a war. All of these costs in labor, financial, and production markets are exactly what the broken window fallacy refers to. They ignore the negative costs that many economies struggle to translate to dollars so as to actually compare it with the direct investment received after the conflict. The idea of war being an economic engine for countries is product of, in many cases, a simplistic single variable analysis of the situation. Yes, direct investment is a fundamental piece in the GDP equation, but that does not mean that the entire context of the serviced economy should be ignored. War is brutal and has no place in the 21st century. From a human perspective, we all ideally know this. But at least, now we can politely ask this group of war-sympathizing economists who have probably never heard the sound of a missile exploding to shut up already. Thank you for watching Rebel Economics. Seeing what the world is going through right now, this video seemed relevant to make. I hope you learned something with it. So if you did, please consider subscribing. We work hard on this analysis and it really helps us when you guys like and subscribe. If you need a bit of a palate cleanser after this depressing episode, why not check out our video about how Disney has changed across the years? Or perhaps you are more curious about how Norway finances their welfare states. You can find both of these videos in your screen right now. Anyway, thank you guys once again and I will see you in the next one.